It was the summer of 1995, and I had been working as a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park for nearly two decades. It was a job I loved, one that connected me to nature and kept me active, but I also knew the dangers that lurked beneath the surface of these serene woods. The Appalachian Mountains, with their dense forests and hidden trails, held secrets that sometimes even the most seasoned rangers couldn't unravel. I was about to confront one such mystery, one that would change my life forever. The day started like any other. I had just finished my morning patrol when a call came over the radio. A hiker had gone missing. The park's visitor center had received a frantic report from a woman named Alice, who had lost sight of her husband Tom, somewhere near Klingman's Dome. He had wandered off the trail, and she couldn't find him. It wasn't the first time I'd dealt with a missing hiker, but something about Alice's voice, shaky and desperate, put me on edge. I met Alice at the visitor center. She was in her late thirties, with auburn hair tied back in a ponytail and worry etched across her face. She clutched a map, her fingers trembling as she traced the path they had taken. He wanted to get a closer look at the wildlife, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I told him not to stray too far, but he's always been adventurous. I nodded, trying to reassure her while my mind raced through possible scenarios. People got lost all the time, but with enough daylight left we had a good chance of finding him. I gathered a small team of rangers, and we set off into the woods, Alice in tow, determined to find Tom before nightfall. The air was thick with humidity as we hiked up the trail. Birds chirped overhead, and the scent of pine lingered in the air. But as we delved deeper, a sense of unease crept over me. It wasn't just the terrain or the potential for a storm that concerned me. It was the forest itself. The further we walked, the more the trees seemed to close in, casting long shadows that danced in the sunlight. Alice pointed us in the direction Tom had last headed, and we spread out, calling his name as we navigated the rough terrain. Hours passed, and there was still no sign of him. No footsteps, no broken branches, nothing. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. The sun dipped lower in the sky, casting an orange glow across the mountains, and I knew we were running out of time. We regrouped to discuss our next steps when one of my colleagues, Jack, mentioned something odd. He'd found an abandoned campsite a few hundred yards away. Curious, we followed him to the site. As we approached, a chill ran through me. The camp was rudimentary. Just a tarp stretched between two trees, a makeshift fire pit with charred logs, and a scattering of empty cans and wrappers. But what caught my attention was a weathered notebook lying near the fire pit. I picked it up, flipping through pages filled with sketches of the forest and disjointed scribbles. Most were indecipherable, but one sentence stood out. The woods are alive. They watch. They listen. Alice, standing beside me, read over my shoulder. What does that mean? She asked, her voice tinged with fear. I don't know. I admitted, but it doesn't look like this has been used recently. Jack nodded, scanning the area. No sign of Tom here, though. Maybe it belonged to someone else. As dusk settled in, we reluctantly decided to head back to the visitor center and organize a larger search for the morning. Alice protested, insisting we keep looking, but we couldn't risk getting lost ourselves in the dark. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. The woods had always been my sanctuary, but now they felt ominous. I tried to rationalize it. Missing hikers, cryptic notes, it was just my mind playing tricks. But sleep eluded me, and I found myself replaying the day's events over and over. The following morning we assembled a larger team and set out at first light. We scoured the area where Tom had disappeared, extending our search to cover more ground. But as the hours dragged on, it became clear that finding him wouldn't be easy. Around midday, we stumbled upon something unexpected. Near a rocky outcrop, we found an old cabin, half hidden by overgrown bushes. It wasn't marked on any of our maps, and judging by the state of disrepair, it hadn't been used in years. 
Curiosity peaked. We approached cautiously. The door creaked as I pushed it open, revealing a single room filled with dust and cobwebs. A rusted stove sat in one corner, and a wooden table, its surface covered in faded maps and yellowed newspaper clippings, occupied the center. But what caught my eye was the wall. It was covered with photographs and notes, pinned haphazardly. Most were blurred images of the forest, but a few were of people, hikers, campers, even a couple of rangers I recognized. Among them was a photo of Tom, taken from a distance, with a date scribbled underneath. Two days ago. Alice gasped, her hand flying to her mouth. That's him, she whispered. Someone's been watching us. A sense of dread washed over me. Whoever had taken these photos had been following people for years, documenting their presence in the park. The thought of someone hiding out here unseen was unsettling. I knew we had to report this discovery to the authorities immediately. As we turned to leave, a rustling sound outside stopped us in our tracks. I motioned for everyone to be quiet, listening intently. The rustling grew louder, and then a figure emerged from the trees. A man, disheveled and wild-eyed, clutching a hunting knife. My heart raced as I recognized him from the photographs on the wall. He was one of the rangers who had gone missing years ago, presumed dead. But here he was, alive and evidently living off the grid all this time. Who are you? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. The man's eyes flicked between us, his expression a mix of fear and anger. You shouldn't be here, he muttered, his voice hoarse. This is my home. We're looking for someone, a hiker named Tom, I explained, trying to keep the situation from escalating. Have you seen him? The man shook his head, backing away. You need to leave. It's not safe here. Before I could respond, he turned and fled into the forest, disappearing among the trees. I stood frozen, unsure of what to do. We needed to find Tom, but now it seemed there was more at play than just a missing hiker. Returning to the visitor center, we contacted the authorities and relayed what we'd found. They organized a more extensive search operation, deploying helicopters and search dogs to comb the area. Meanwhile, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were dealing with something far more complex than a simple disappearance. Over the next few days, the search continued, but Tom remained elusive. We found more signs of his presence, a discarded backpack, a torn piece of clothing, but no definitive answers. The park was vast, and the dense foliage made it easy for someone to hide indefinitely. It was during one of these search days while I was patrolling a remote section of the park, that I had another encounter. I was walking along a narrow trail when I spotted movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to see the man again, standing just a few yards away, watching me. Please, I need your help, I called out, keeping my distance. We're just trying to find Tom. The man hesitated, then slowly approached. Up close, I could see the wear and tear of years spent surviving in the wild. His clothes were tattered, his hair matted, but his eyes held a flicker of recognition. Tom, he murmured, nodding as if to himself. He's near the falls. I frowned, trying to make sense of his words. The falls? You've seen him? The man nodded again, a hint of urgency in his expression. He's hiding, scared, but you have to be careful. They don't like intruders. Who are they? I asked, but before he could answer, a rustling in the bushes behind him made him tense. Without another word, he turned and vanished into the forest once more. I radioed my team, relaying the information. We decided to head to the falls, a secluded area known for its treacherous cliffs and cascading waters. If Tom was there, we needed to find him before something, or someone, else did. As we approached the falls, the sound of rushing water grew louder, drowning out the noise of the forest. The area was breathtakingly beautiful, but also perilous, with slippery rocks and steep drop-offs. We spread out, searching the surrounding area, calling Tom's name over the roar of the falls. 
It was Jack who spotted him first. Tom was perched on a ledge, half hidden by an overhang, looking disheveled and frightened. His clothes were torn, and he had a wild look in his eyes, as if he had been through a harrowing ordeal. Tom! I shouted, waving to get his attention. It's okay. We're here to help. He hesitated, then slowly climbed down, his movements cautious and deliberate. As he reached us, relief washed over his features, and he sank to the ground, exhausted but alive. Alice rushed forward, enveloping him in a hug, tears streaming down her face. I thought I'd lost you, she sobbed, holding him tight. Tom nodded, his voice barely audible. I got lost. I didn't know how to find my way back. As we led him back to safety, Tom recounted his experience. He had indeed wandered off the trail, but when he tried to return, he couldn't find the path. The forest seemed to shift around him, leading him deeper into its depths. He had stumbled upon the old cabin and realized someone was watching him, prompting him to hide near the falls. He spoke of feeling watched, of hearing whispers in the night, but couldn't provide any concrete details about who or what was out there. It was clear he was traumatized, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to his story. In the days that followed, the authorities launched a thorough investigation, uncovering more about the mysterious man we had encountered. He was identified as a former ranger who had disappeared over a decade ago, presumed dead after a hiking accident. But somehow, he had survived, living off the land and watching over the park in his own way. The cabin, it turned out, had been his hideout, a place where he documented the comings and goings of visitors, trying to protect the land he loved. His motives remained unclear, but his warning about intruders seemed to suggest he believed he was safeguarding the park from unseen threats. Tom eventually recovered from his ordeal, though the experience left a lasting mark on him. He and Alice returned to their lives, grateful for their second chance, but the mystery of the mountains lingered in their minds. As for me, I continued my work as a ranger. My respect for the power and mystery of the Smokies deepened. The forest, with its ancient trees and hidden paths, held stories that might never be fully understood. But I knew one thing for certain. Beneath the beauty of the wilderness lay secrets that would forever remain shrouded in the mist, watched over by the silent guardians of the Appalachian Mountains. It was one of those crisp autumn mornings in the Appalachian Mountains, where the air felt clean and the colors of the leaves seemed impossibly vibrant. I had worked as a park ranger at Great Smoky Mountains National Park for a decade, so I'd seen plenty of such mornings, each more beautiful than the last. My name is Hunter Fields, and I was about to experience a string of events that would etch this particular morning into my memory forever. I was stationed at a remote post called Lookout Point. It was one of those places tourists loved because of its breathtaking views, but it rarely saw any heavy foot traffic due to the long, winding trails leading up to it. We were still a good month away from the holiday season, so the crowds hadn't descended yet. Most days I would spend my time greeting the odd hiker or two and performing routine maintenance checks. That morning, as I sipped my coffee, I scanned the trailhead with my binoculars. The park was coming alive with birds chirping, leaves rustling, and the faint sound of a waterfall in the distance. Then I noticed something unusual, a lone figure moving up the path. There was nothing inherently strange about someone hiking alone, but this person was carrying what looked like an old army duffel bag slung over his shoulder. It wasn't the kind of gear one usually took on a leisurely hike. As the figure approached, I could make out more details. He was an older man, maybe in his sixties, with a scruffy beard and a weathered face that told tales of many years spent outdoors. He wore a faded flannel shirt and old hiking boots that looked like they'd seen better days. There was something about his gait, slow and deliberate, that made me uneasy. Morning, 
I called out as he drew nearer, keeping my tone friendly. Beautiful day for a hike, isn't it? He stopped and looked at me with piercing blue eyes. There was something unsettling about the way he studied me, like he was sizing me up. After a pause, he replied, Sure is. Been coming here a long time. Just can't stay away. I nodded, trying to keep the conversation light. Glad to have you back. Name's Hunter. I'm the ranger up here. He hesitated, then said, Jack. Jack Lawson. Nice to meet you, Jack, I said. Staying in the area for a while? Yeah, he replied, not offering any more information. With a curt nod, he continued up the trail without another word. I watched him disappear into the forest, an uneasy feeling gnawing at me. Something about Jack Lawson didn't sit right. Maybe it was just the years of working in the park service that had made me wary of loners carrying large bags, or maybe it was the way he had looked at me. The day passed uneventfully, but Jack's presence lingered in my mind. Later in the afternoon, I decided to do a patrol up the trail to clear my head. As I walked through the woods, the sun began its descent, casting long shadows that danced in the breeze. It was beautiful, but there was a sense of isolation that gnawed at me, amplifying the sounds of my footsteps. As I neared one of the more secluded spots on the trail, I noticed something odd, a faint smell of smoke. It wasn't unusual for campers to build small fires, but this didn't smell like a campfire. It was acrid and sharp. I followed the scent until I came upon a small clearing. What I saw stopped me in my tracks. There, in the middle of the clearing, was the remnants of a fire. Scattered around it were bones, not large ones but small and charred. My heart rate quickened. These weren't animal bones, and I could feel my skin crawl as I realized they looked eerily like human remains. Suddenly, a noise behind me made me spin around, my hand instinctively reaching for the bear spray on my belt. It was Jack, emerging from the trees, his face obscured by shadows. He stood there, silent, just watching me. What is this? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. He took a step forward, his eyes never leaving mine. Just a campfire, he said, his voice calm and measured. You should know that. I gestured toward the bones. These aren't from any animal I know. Jack shrugged, unfazed. You spend enough time in these woods. You find all sorts of things. There was a strange intensity in his eyes, a simmering hostility that sent a chill down my spine. What are you doing out here, Jack? He tilted his head slightly, a faint smile playing at the corners of his mouth. I could ask you the same thing, Hunter. We stood there, locked in a silent standoff, the forest around us holding its breath. I realized I didn't have any authority to detain him without cause, but my instincts screamed that Jack was dangerous. Finally, I said, I'll need to report this. It's procedure. Jack nodded slowly. Of course. You do what you need to do. With that, he turned and vanished into the woods, leaving me alone with the unsettling scene. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves, and pulled out my radio to call in the discovery. That night, as I sat in the small ranger station, my mind raced with questions. Who was Jack Lawson, and what was he doing out here? Why the bones? Why the fire? I knew I needed more information, so I delved into the archives, hoping to find something that could shed light on the situation. What I found was chilling. Thirty years ago, a man named Jack Lawson had disappeared in these mountains. He was a Vietnam veteran who'd returned home only to find himself struggling to fit back into society. After a series of tragic events, including the loss of his family in a house fire, he vanished without a trace. The case had gone cold, but there had been rumors that he'd retreated into the mountains, choosing to live off the grid. The pieces began to fall into place. Could the man I met today 
be the same Jack Lawson? If so, he'd been surviving in these woods for decades, possibly with a grudge against the world that had abandoned him. The following day, I decided to return to the clearing with a couple of other rangers. We needed to secure the site and gather whatever evidence we could find. As we approached the spot, the smell of smoke was gone, replaced by the earthy scent of the forest. The fire pit was still there, but the bones were gone, as if someone had meticulously cleaned up the site. It was unsettling, the thought that Jack could be watching us from somewhere nearby, always a step ahead. As we searched the area, we found something I hadn't noticed the day before, a small carved wooden figurine lying half buried in the dirt. It was a crude depiction of a soldier, detailed and hauntingly lifelike. I picked it up, studying the craftsmanship. This was no casual whittling project. It was the work of someone with time and dedication. Looks like someone's been busy, one of the other rangers said, eyeing the figurine. I nodded, pocketing the small carving. It felt significant, though I couldn't quite place why. There was something deeply personal about it, as if it held a part of Jack's story. Back at the station, I contacted the authorities to report the incident. They promised to send a team to investigate further, but I knew it would take time for them to get organized and reach such a remote location. Meanwhile, I couldn't shake the feeling that Jack was always nearby, watching, waiting. The following days were tense. I went about my duties with an added layer of caution. My senses heightened to every sound and movement. The woods, which had always felt like a haven, now seemed full of secrets and shadows. One afternoon, as I patrolled a different part of the park, I came across another campsite. This one was more elaborate, with a makeshift shelter built from branches and leaves. It was clear someone had been living here, though there was no sign of them now. I searched the site, my heart pounding with a mix of fear and curiosity. Inside the shelter, I found a collection of notebooks, each filled with pages of writing. Most of it was unintelligible, scrawled in a tight, cramped hand. But there were drawings, too, sketches of the mountains, the trees, and people. Faces, countless faces, some familiar, others not. There was a sense of isolation and longing in the drawings, a glimpse into a mind that had been left alone for too long. As I leafed through the notebooks, I found a name repeated over and over. Emily. There were drawings of a young girl, her face always smiling, her eyes full of life. I realized she must have been someone important to Jack, possibly his daughter. The loss of his family must have driven him to retreat into these mountains, to escape a world that had taken everything from him. Suddenly, a noise outside made me freeze. Footsteps, deliberate and measured. I turned slowly, knowing who I would find. Jack stood at the entrance of the shelter, his expression unreadable. He didn't seem surprised to see me there, as if he'd been expecting it all along. You found my work, he said his voice devoid of emotion. I nodded, unsure of what to say. There was a vulnerability about him now, a sadness that hadn't been there before. Emily was my daughter, he continued, his gaze distant. She died in that fire, the fire I should have saved her from. His words hung in the air, heavy with the weight of years gone by. I felt a pang of empathy for the man before me, a father who had lost everything. What happened, Jack? I asked, keeping my voice gentle. He sighed, a deep, weary sound. The world happened. I came back from the war and nothing made sense anymore. I lost my family, lost myself. These woods became my refuge. I nodded, understanding the pull of solitude, the need to escape. But there was more to his story a darkness that lingered just out of reach. The bones, I said cautiously. What were they? Jack's expression hardened, the vulnerability slipping away. A reminder, he said cryptically, of what was lost, of what I couldn't save. There was a finality to his words, 
a sense that the conversation was over. I knew I couldn't push him further, not without risking his fragile trust. As I made my way back to the station, my mind was a whirlwind of thoughts. Jack Lawson was a man haunted by his past, driven to the edge by loss and grief. But there was a darkness to him, a sense of danger that couldn't be ignored. The investigation into the bones continued, but the trail went cold. Without any evidence or leads, it became just another unsolved mystery of the mountains, a story whispered among those who dared to venture into the woods. As for Jack, he disappeared once more, slipping back into the wilderness he called home. I never saw him again, but his presence lingered, a ghost among the trees. The figurine I found that day remains on my desk, a reminder of the man I met and the story he told. The story of a father's love, a soldier's grief, and the shadows that dwell in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. Every now and then, I find myself wandering those trails, half expecting to see him there, watching from the trees. And maybe one day, I will. But until then, I'll keep his story alive, a testament to the power of memory and the enduring spirit of the human heart. As a park ranger, I've seen some strange things, but nothing prepared me for what happened in the summer of 1997. I was stationed in the remote wilderness of the Grand Canyon National Park, a place known for its breathtaking views and rugged terrain. It was a dream assignment for someone like me who loved the outdoors and had spent years navigating the challenges of nature. Little did I know this time, nature had something else in store. It started as an ordinary summer day. The sun was shining, and the temperature was just shy of boiling, a typical day in the desert. My shift began with the usual routine, checking the visitor center, making sure the trails were safe, and keeping an eye on the tourists who often underestimated the harshness of the environment. The park was teeming with life, the air filled with the sounds of families chatting and the occasional bird call echoing through the canyon. As the day wore on, the heat became oppressive. I was patrolling one of the less traveled trails when I spotted someone sitting on a rock up ahead. As I approached, I realized it was an old friend from my college days, Jack Sully Sullivan. I hadn't seen him in years, but there he was, looking as out of place as a polar bear in a desert, clad in a worn-out flannel shirt and hiking boots that had seen better days. Sully, what brings you out here? I called out, genuinely surprised to see him. He looked up, squinting against the sun, and broke into a wide grin. Tommy, long time no see, man. I heard you were out here. Figured I'd pay you a visit. We caught up for a bit, reminiscing about old times and swapping stories. Sully was one of those guys who always seemed to have a knack for finding trouble or adventure, depending on how you looked at it. He had a restless spirit, always searching for the next thrill, the next story to tell. I've been hearing about some strange things happening around here, Sully said, his tone shifting to a more serious note. Local legends, mysterious disappearances, you know, the kind of stuff that makes for good campfire tales. I nodded. Yeah, there's always been talk of the weird stuff. The locals have stories about skinwalkers, creatures that can shapeshift and mimic voices. Mostly just folklore to keep kids in line, if you ask me. Sully chuckled. Well, I'm here to find out if there's any truth to it. You up for a little investigation, old buddy? I hesitated. Sully's enthusiasm was infectious, but the idea of chasing down legends felt like a distraction from my duties. Still, the thought of spending some time with Sully and potentially uncovering something interesting was tempting. All right, I'm in, I said, eventually giving in. But we keep it safe and don't do anything stupid. Deal, Sully agreed, a mischievous twinkle in his eye. We spent the next few days exploring the park, talking to locals, and digging into the stories that had been passed down through generations. Many spoke of strange lights in the sky and odd animal sightings, but nothing concrete. 
It was like chasing shadows, but Sully was determined. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the canyon, we set up camp near a secluded area known for its supposed supernatural activity. The air was cooler now, the desert's heat giving way to a crisp night chill. We sat around a small fire, the flames flickering against the darkness, casting eerie shapes against the rocks. So what's the plan? I asked, poking the fire with a stick. We wait, Sully replied, his eyes scanning the dark landscape around us. If there's something out there, it'll show itself. Hours passed, and the night grew quieter. The occasional rustle of leaves and the distant call of an owl were the only sounds breaking the stillness. I was starting to feel foolish, sitting out there chasing after myths, when suddenly a strange sound pierced the silence. It was a low, mournful cry, echoing through the canyon, unlike anything I had ever heard. It sent a shiver down my spine, and I could see Sully perk up, his eyes wide with excitement. You hear that? he whispered, barely containing his excitement. I nodded, my heart racing. What do you think it is? Before Sully could answer, the sound came again, closer this time. It was followed by a series of guttural noises, a cacophony that seemed to resonate from all directions. Sully and I exchanged glances, and without a word, we grabbed our flashlights and headed toward the source of the sound. The beam of my flashlight cut through the darkness, illuminating the rugged terrain as we navigated the rocky path. As we neared a clearing, I spotted something unusual. At first it looked like a large animal, but as we got closer, the shape shifted, morphing into something vaguely humanoid. My mind raced, struggling to comprehend what I was seeing. Sully's grip on my arm tightened. Tommy, do you see that? I nodded, unable to tear my eyes away from the figure. It moved with an unnatural grace, its eyes reflecting the light from our flashlights. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, a terrifying blend of man and beast. We watched in stunned silence as the creature turned and vanished into the darkness, leaving behind a lingering sense of dread. The air was thick with tension, the night suddenly alive with possibilities. What the hell was that? Sully whispered, his voice barely audible. I don't know, I replied, my mind racing. But we need to be careful. Over the next few days, the atmosphere around the park shifted. Word of our encounter spread among the staff, fueling speculation and fear. Some dismissed it as a trick of the light, while others believed we had stumbled upon something truly extraordinary. Sully and I continued our investigation, determined to uncover the truth. We delved into the park's history, uncovering stories of similar sightings dating back decades. Each account was eerily similar, describing a creature that defied explanation. One evening, as I was reviewing the notes in my cabin, there was a knock on the door. It was Sully, looking more serious than I'd ever seen him. We need to talk, he said, stepping inside. What's going on? I asked, sensing something was wrong. I've been doing some digging, Sully replied, lowering his voice. And I think we're in over our heads. This isn't just a legend, Tommy. It's real. His words sent a chill through me. I knew Sully was prone to exaggeration, but the look in his eyes told me he believed what he was saying. Have you found anything concrete? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Sully nodded. I talked to some of the older rangers, and they've seen things too. Strange disappearances, unexplained phenomena. It's all connected. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. The thought that there was something dangerous out there, lurking in the shadows, was unsettling. But I knew I couldn't back down. Not now. We need to warn people, I said, my resolve strengthening. We can't let anyone else get hurt. Sully agreed, and we spent the next few days compiling our findings, determined to present them to the park authorities. It wasn't easy. Many dismissed our claims as nonsense, but a few listened, 
their expressions growing more concerned as we laid out the evidence. As we prepared to take our findings to the authorities, the situation escalated. Reports of missing hikers began to surface, fueling fear and speculation. Each disappearance was shrouded in mystery, the only trace a set of footprints leading into the wilderness. The park was on edge, the usual bustle of tourists and rangers replaced by a tense silence. Everyone was on high alert, eyes scanning the landscape for any sign of the elusive creature. One night, as I was patrolling the park's perimeter, I caught sight of something moving in the distance. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I watched the figure approach. It moved with an eerie fluidity, its form shifting in the darkness. I fumbled for my radio, my hands shaking as I called for backup. This is Ranger Thomas. I've got eyes on the target, requesting immediate assistance. The radio crackled with static, but I barely heard it. My attention was focused on the creature, its eyes glowing in the moonlight as it advanced toward me. I backed away slowly, my flashlight trained on the figure. It paused as if studying me before letting out a chilling cry that echoed through the canyon. My instincts kicked in and I turned and ran, my footsteps echoing against the rocks. I could hear the creature behind me, its footsteps eerily silent as it pursued me. Just as I reached the ranger station, the creature vanished into the night, leaving me shaken and breathless. My colleagues were quick to respond, their flashlights cutting through the darkness as they searched for any sign of the creature. But it was gone, leaving behind only a sense of unease that lingered in the air. The following morning, Sully and I met with the park authorities, presenting our findings and urging them to take action. They listened intently, their expressions serious as we detailed the encounters and the recent disappearances. We need to close off the area, I argued, my voice firm. It's too dangerous. We can't risk anyone else getting hurt. The authorities agreed, and a plan was put in place to increase patrols and monitor the area for any unusual activity. It wasn't a perfect solution, but it was a start. As the days passed, the park gradually returned to a semblance of normalcy. The missing hikers were never found, their disappearances a haunting reminder of the dangers that lurked in the wilderness. Sully and I continued our investigation, determined to uncover the truth behind the legend. We spent countless hours piecing together the fragments of evidence, driven by a desire to protect the park and those who visited it. In the end, we never found the creature. It remained an enigma, a ghostly presence that haunted the edges of our understanding. But we knew it was out there, watching and waiting. I often think back to that summer, to the strange encounters and the unanswered questions. It was a reminder that the world is full of mysteries, some of which are better left unexplored. But for Sully and me, it was a summer we would never forget, a reminder of the thin line between myth and reality and the dangers that lurk in the shadows. And though the creature remains a mystery, its legend lives on, a chilling tale passed down through the generations, a reminder of the unexplained and the unknown. I had always loved the park. That was before things changed, before fear had settled over my heart like a shroud, before the sense of foreboding seeped into the forest itself. My name is Wyatt Halverson, and for over two decades I served as a park ranger in Grand Teton National Park. It was a job I took for granted, back when I thought I understood the lay of the land, the wilderness. But what I'm about to tell you shattered that illusion, and left a mark on my soul I can't quite shake off. This story begins in late September of 1995, a time when the days were getting shorter and the air was crisp, tinged with the scent of pine and the faint promise of winter. Tourists had started to thin out, leaving behind a quieter wilderness, just the way we locals liked it. Those of us who remained knew the land well. Every trail and rocky outcrop, every hidden nook where elk and deer roamed. But something was different that year. It started with a call on a Tuesday morning. A couple had gone missing. Not an unusual occurrence, mind you. 
People often underestimated the wild, believing that they could handle themselves out there without much preparation. The woman's name was Heather, and the man was called Caleb. They were both in their mid-twenties, college grads on a break before they jumped into the so-called real world. Or that's how their friend, who had stayed behind and reported them missing, described them when we met at the visitor center. Wyatt, you think they just got turned around? Asked Tom, another ranger I had worked with for years. His voice was casual, but there was an edge to it. Maybe, I replied, though I felt uneasy. Let's start at Signal Mountain and spread out. If they're lost, they've probably stuck to the main trails. You take north and I'll go south. Tom nodded and we set off, each armed with a radio and a map, knowing the mountains well enough to traverse them blindfolded if need be. As I hiked, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The forest was alive with sounds, branches rustling, distant calls of birds. But beneath it all was an unsettling quiet, a kind of tension I hadn't felt before. I chalked it up to nerves. The responsibility of finding lost hikers weighed heavily. The search continued the next day, and the day after that, with no sign of Heather and Caleb. Each evening we regrouped, our small team of rangers and volunteers growing increasingly frustrated. I'd seen it before, a grim waiting game, hoping for the best, fearing the worst. Then, on the fifth day, we found them. It was early morning, the sun just beginning to cast long shadows through the trees when I stumbled upon something unusual. The area was off the beaten path, a dense thicket with gnarled roots that seemed to claw at the earth. And there, lying among the leaves, was Caleb's backpack. It was torn, as if by some animal, but that wasn't what sent a chill through me. It was the smell, a rancid, metallic scent that told me something terrible had happened here. Tom, I've got something, I said into my radio, trying to keep my voice steady. I gave him the coordinates, and within minutes he was there, his face grim as he took in the scene. We followed a faint trail of disturbed earth and broken branches until we found Heather. She was lying on her side, her face pale, eyes wide open but unseeing. Her body was marked with wounds that made my stomach churn. We found Caleb a little farther on. It was the same story. Their bodies bore marks that seemed too precise, too deliberate to have been inflicted by a bear or a mountain lion or any other animal known to these parts. This doesn't make sense, Tom murmured, shaking his head. His usual composure was gone, replaced by a shadow of fear. We notified the authorities, of course, and the investigation began. The official report would likely cite some animal attack, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something else, something more sinister at play. Days turned into weeks, and the park seemed to close in on itself, the towering trees casting darker shadows, the air colder than it should have been. I wasn't sleeping well, haunted by nightmares I couldn't fully remember come morning. One evening, as I sat at home nursing a cup of coffee, I got a call from a man named Elliot, a friend of Caleb's from college. He was desperate to talk, so I agreed to meet him at the park headquarters the next day. Elliot was in his late twenties, his hair slightly unkempt, eyes shadowed with worry. He was the kind of guy who exuded intelligence but also a certain unease, as if he was aware of things most people ignored. Wyatt, thank you for seeing me, he began, his voice low. I need to know what happened to Caleb and Heather. The official story doesn't add up. They weren't the type to just wander off the trail. I nodded, understanding his frustration. I wish I had answers for you, but... There's something you're not telling me, Elliot interrupted, leaning forward. I've been doing some digging on my own and, well, have you heard of skinwalkers? The word sent a shiver through me. I had heard of them, of course. Legends told by the Native American tribes, stories of beings who could change shape, take on the guise of animals or even people. But they were just that. Stories. Those are just myths. I said, trying to keep my tone even. Elliot didn't back down. 
Look, I know how it sounds. But what if there's something out here? Something that doesn't want to be found? I wanted to dismiss him. To tell him he was chasing phantoms. But a part of me, the part that had sensed something off in the woods, couldn't entirely reject his theory. We parted ways with no real resolution, but Elliot's words lingered. They fueled the strange, unsettling dreams that plagued me. Dreams where shadows moved and the forest itself seemed alive with malice. Weeks passed and the world moved on. The park prepared for winter, the trees shedding their leaves, the air crisp and biting. But the fear remained, gnawing at me, refusing to be silenced. It was early November when the next incident occurred. A family had come to the park, hoping to catch the last of the autumn colors before the snows arrived. They were seasoned hikers, well prepared, but they never returned to their car. The search was swift, our team now on high alert, aware that something darker than any of us had imagined lurked in these woods. We found their campsite first, a neatly arranged site, now eerily quiet, the air thick with anticipation. The family was missing, but there were signs of a struggle, torn clothing, scattered gear. And then there were the footprints, strange and misshapen, leading deeper into the forest. We followed the trail, our flashlights cutting through the gloom as night descended. My heart pounded in my chest, each step bringing us closer to whatever waited in the shadows. We found them at dawn, or what was left of them. The scene was brutal, unlike anything I had ever witnessed. The bodies bore the same marks as Heather and Caleb, a grotesque mimicry of violence that defied explanation. I couldn't take it anymore. The fear, the not knowing, it gnawed at me until I felt like I was unraveling. After the bodies were recovered, I went straight to my supervisor and told him I needed time off. He understood, of course. We were all feeling it, this creeping dread that had settled over the park. I decided to take a trip to one of the nearby reservations, seeking answers I hoped would lay my fears to rest. There, I spoke with an elder named Anna, a wise woman who had seen the world change many times over. She listened patiently as I recounted the events, her eyes sharp and knowing. When I finished, she was silent for a long moment, her expression unreadable. There are things in this world we do not understand, she said finally. Things that have been here long before us. The land remembers, and sometimes it fights back. I nodded, feeling the weight of her words. Do you think... Could it be one of those skinwalkers? She met my gaze, her eyes steady. Perhaps. Or perhaps it is something else, something that has taken on a life of its own in these woods. But remember, Wyatt, whatever it is, it is not invincible. I left the reservation with more questions than answers, but also with a sense of resolve. I couldn't let fear rule me. I had a duty to protect the park, to ensure that no more lives were lost. When I returned, the first snows had begun to fall, blanketing the park in a deceptive calm. We intensified our patrols, alert for any sign of the creature, or creatures, that had terrorized us. And then, just before Christmas, we caught a break. A group of hunters, out tracking deer, reported a strange sight, a creature, they said, moving through the trees, unlike anything they had ever seen. We followed their directions, a team of us armed and ready, hearts pounding with adrenaline and fear. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the forest seemed to close in around us, the shadows darker, more menacing. Then we saw it. A figure, hunched and misshapen, moving with an unnatural grace. It was neither fully human nor animal, a grotesque fusion that sent a wave of terror through us. For a moment none of us moved, frozen by the sight. And then, as if sensing our presence, it turned. Its eyes glowed with a feral intelligence, and a sound, a scream or a howl I couldn't tell, echoed through the trees. I fired first, the crack of the gunshot shattering the stillness. The others followed, 
bullets piercing the night as we aimed for the creature. It staggered, let out another cry, and then vanished into the woods, leaving behind only silence. We found blood, dark and viscous, but no sign of the creature. We searched for hours, but it was as if it had never existed, a specter that slipped through our grasp. The attacks stopped after that. The park returned to a semblance of normalcy, though the memory of those days lingered like a shadow. I returned to my duties, but with a newfound respect for the mysteries of the land. Years have passed since then, and I've told this story only to a few. It sounds unbelievable, I know, a tale spun from the fears of the night. But for those of us who lived it, the truth is clear. There are things in this world that defy understanding, things that dwell in the spaces between light and shadow. I've come to accept that some questions will never be answered. I still walk the trails, still patrol the park, but always with a watchful eye, always with the memory of those lost and the hope that their spirits have found peace. And as for the creature, the skinwalker, or whatever it was, perhaps it's still out there somewhere in the wilds, a guardian of secrets we are not meant to know. But now, I find solace in the thought that we too are part of this land, its mysteries and its stories. I've been a park ranger for over two decades, spending countless nights alone under the vast and starry skies of the American wilderness. My name is Tom Ridley, and I've seen my fair share of what nature can do, both its beauty and its brutality. But nothing prepared me for the summer of 1995 in Glacier National Park. It was the year I realized that sometimes the most terrifying things aren't what you find lurking in the woods, but what the elements themselves can conjure. It started like any other summer, with a fresh group of young seasonal rangers joining us. Among them was a particularly eager fellow named Lewis Carmichael. Lewis was straight out of college, full of stories about his time hiking the Appalachian Trail and dreams of becoming a naturalist. His enthusiasm was contagious, and I took him under my wing, showing him the ropes and teaching him the finer points of the job. We were tasked with a week-long patrol through a less-traveled part of the park, an area notorious for its unpredictable weather and rugged terrain. The route took us past Granite Park Chalet, an old stone building perched on a ridge like a sentinel, watching over the mountains. The plan was simple, hike in, spend a couple of nights at the chalet, and then loop back around to the main ranger station. The first few days were uneventful filled with the usual awe-inspiring views and routine checks of the backcountry campsites. The weather held steady with clear skies and a warm sun that lulled us into a false sense of security. Lewis and I shared stories by the campfire each night, his laughter echoing through the trees as we exchanged tales of past experiences. On the third night, we arrived at Granite Park Chalet just as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink. The old building stood solid and reassuring against the gathering dusk. Inside, the wooden floors creaked under our boots, and the air was cool with a faint smell of cedar. Lewis was buzzing with excitement, thrilled to be spending the night in such an iconic location. As we settled in, a group of hikers arrived, grateful for the shelter. Among them was a family from Ohio, their young daughter Claire, full of questions about the park. Her curiosity was endearing, and Lewis happily answered her queries, telling her all about the stars and the animals that roamed the forests. That night, as we sat around the large stone fireplace, a sudden wind picked up, howling through the trees like an eerie symphony. The temperature dropped sharply, and the fire crackled and sputtered against the gusts. Outside, the night seemed to thicken, as if the darkness was pressing in on the chalet from all sides. In the morning, we awoke to a world transformed. Overnight, a severe storm had rolled in, leaving everything coated in a thick layer of ice. 
The trees were encased in glassy sheaths, and the paths were treacherously slick. The air was bitterly cold, with a biting wind that seemed determined to slice through our layers of clothing. The hikers debated whether to stay put or attempt the descent. But with supplies running low and no way of knowing how long the storm would last, they decided to press on, hoping to make it to the safety of the nearest trailhead before conditions worsened. Lewis and I assured them we'd guide them as far as we could, and we set out with our ice axes and crampons. The trek was grueling. The ice-covered trail was a relentless obstacle, every step requiring intense concentration to avoid slipping. The wind was unyielding, and I had to shout to be heard over its roar. Lewis stayed close to Claire and her family, offering words of encouragement as we trudged onward. Hours passed, and progress was slow. The storm showed no signs of abating, and I could see the worry etched on the faces of our group. The path wound along a narrow ridge, with steep drops on either side. My heart pounded as we navigated the precarious route, each step a test of balance and nerve. Then, disaster struck. A gust of wind stronger than any before hit us with full force, knocking us off our feet. I heard a scream and turned to see Claire, her small frame tumbling towards the edge. Lewis lunged, grabbing her arm and pulling her back from the brink, but in that split second he lost his footing. I watched in horror as he slid towards the edge, the ice offering no purchase. I reached out, my fingers brushing against his jacket as he disappeared over the side. The world seemed to stop, the storm silencing in the wake of his fall. Claire's sobs cut through the stillness, a stark reminder of the gravity of the situation. I scrambled to the edge, peering over the abyss. Below, a dense bank of snow cushioned Lewis, but he was unconscious, his body crumpled at an awkward angle. My training kicked in, and I radioed for help, knowing that a rescue in these conditions would be a monumental task. We managed to stabilize Lewis, using ropes and harnesses to lower ourselves to him. His pulse was weak, but he was alive. I splinted his leg as best I could and wrapped him in my parka, trying to keep him warm while we waited for the rescue team. It took hours for the helicopter to arrive, and every minute felt like a lifetime. The storm raged on, a relentless beast that seemed determined to claim us all. But eventually, the sound of rotor blades cut through the howling wind, and a team of rescuers descended to our aid. They airlifted Lewis first, then the rest of us, bringing us back to the safety of the main ranger station. Claire's family was shaken but unharmed, and they thanked us repeatedly for our help. As for Lewis, he spent weeks in the hospital, recovering from a broken leg and a concussion. He was lucky to be alive, and we all knew it. The storm eventually passed, leaving behind a landscape forever altered by its fury. Trees lay shattered, and paths were blocked by fallen debris. It took months to clear the damage, and the memory of that day haunted me long after the snow had melted. Looking back, I realize how close we came to losing everything to the merciless whims of nature. The wilderness is beautiful but unpredictable, a place where the line between life and death is as thin as a blade of grass. We can prepare, we can plan, but ultimately, we are at the mercy of forces beyond our control. That summer taught me the true meaning of fear, not from the shadows or monsters of folklore, but from the very world around us. It was a reminder that in the face of nature's wrath, we are all fragile and small. And yet, in that fragility, there is also a profound strength, a determination to survive and protect one another, no matter the odds. As I sit here now, writing this story and reflecting on those harrowing days, I feel a deep gratitude for the lives saved and a somber respect for the lives lost in the wilderness. Lewis and I still keep in touch, his spirit undaunted by the ordeal. We laugh about that summer now, the camaraderie forged in the crucible of adversity unbreakable. The wilderness will always be a part of me, a constant reminder of the delicate dance between humanity and nature. It's a dance I cherish, even as I respect the unpredictable partner that is the natural world. And with each passing year, I find myself returning to the trails, humbled by their beauty 
and ever vigilant of their power. When you work in a national park for over a decade, you develop a sixth sense for changes in the environment. The rustle of leaves, the direction of the wind, even the smell of the air tells you when something's not quite right. That's what kept me alive during that horrendous week in 1995 when Yellowstone Park turned into a hellscape that would haunt me forever. I've been a park ranger since I was 20. My name is Joe Harrison, but out here, I'm just Ranger Joe. Back then, I was stationed at Yellowstone, a place that always had its share of dangers, from wildlife to rogue weather. I thought I'd seen it all until that January, when a snowstorm rolled in that was unlike anything I'd experienced before. I remember the day it started because it was the first time we got a report about a group of campers who hadn't checked in. Routine, I thought, probably just caught up in the beauty of the park and lost track of time. Winter camping isn't uncommon here, but in January it takes a certain kind of person to brave the elements. These folks were experienced hikers, supposedly, but even seasoned outdoorsmen make mistakes. The storm came on suddenly, with winds that screamed through the trees and snow that fell so fast it was hard to see your hand in front of your face. Our radios crackled with reports of trees down across roads and campers getting lost. The missing group had made their camp on the outskirts of the Shoshone Lake, which, this time of year, is only accessible by snowmobile. Two other rangers and I set out on our snowmobiles to try and find them before things got worse. The air was sharp enough to cut skin, and the wind was relentless, but we were used to such conditions. The trip to Shoshone should have taken no more than a couple of hours, but the snow made it nearly impossible to navigate and it stretched into an agonizing six-hour crawl. When we finally reached their campsite, it was deserted. Not in the way you'd expect, though. There were signs of a struggle. One of their tents had been slashed open, and supplies were scattered everywhere. We radioed back to headquarters, who advised us to start a search. Daylight was fading fast, so we split up, each taking a different direction around the lake. The further I went, the more it felt like I was being watched. It was an instinct, a sensation like ice crawling up my spine. I'd learned to trust those instincts, though, and it put me on high alert. The trees creaked and groaned under the weight of the snow, creating a soundscape that could drive anyone mad. After an hour of fighting through snowdrifts, I saw something out of place. A flash of color among the trees. As I got closer, I realized it was one of the campers, huddled against a tree, half buried in snow. Her name was Sarah, and she was barely conscious, suffering from hypothermia. She was mumbling about someone named Mark, insisting that he was still out there, somewhere. Sarah was in bad shape. I wrapped her in my thermal blanket and gave her some hot liquid from my thermos. As she started to come around, she told me what happened. Their group had been caught off guard by the storm, and one of their members, Mark, had started acting strange. He was insisting that someone was following them, convinced they were in danger. When Sarah mentioned him running off into the blizzard, my stomach tightened with dread. I managed to get Sarah back to our rendezvous point. By then, the other rangers had returned with no sign of the other campers. We had to make the difficult decision to return to the ranger station and report what we'd found. The storm was worsening, and if we stayed out any longer, we risked getting lost ourselves. Back at the station, we relayed the information to the search and rescue team, who immediately started planning a larger search operation. The storm showed no signs of letting up, and as night fell, the temperature plummeted even further. We were stuck waiting until morning, and it was the longest night of my life. I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible had happened, or was about to. At first light, we set out again, this time with a larger team. We found the other campers within a few hours. Three of them were huddled together in a makeshift shelter they'd dug into the snow. They were frostbitten and exhausted, but alive. Mark, however, was nowhere to be found. His footprints led away from the shelter and into the dense forest. 
The story the campers told was strange and disturbing. Mark had become increasingly paranoid, claiming he could hear voices and see figures in the trees. They had tried to calm him down, but in the night he had just snapped, slashing the tent and running off into the storm, leaving the others bewildered and terrified. Our search for Mark continued for another two days. By now the storm had abated, leaving a serene, deadly landscape in its wake. On the third day, we found him. Or rather, we found what was left of him. His body was discovered at the bottom of a ravine, where he must have slipped and fallen to his death. The expression on his face was one of sheer terror, frozen in death, eyes wide open and unseeing. In the following weeks, as the snow began to melt, we learned more about what might have happened. Mark had a history of mental illness, something his friends were unaware of when they planned their trip. The isolation and the storm likely triggered a psychotic break, leading to his tragic end. The experience shook me to my core. Working in national parks, you always know that nature can be unforgiving, but this was something else entirely. It was as if the very wilderness had conspired against us, a reminder that we are always at the mercy of the elements, no matter how prepared we think we are. It took a long time for me to come to terms with what happened that week. There were nights I couldn't sleep, haunted by the image of Mark's face and the feeling of being watched in the storm. I stayed on as a ranger, though, determined not to let fear drive me away from the work I loved. Over time, I learned to respect the power of the natural world even more, and to listen to those instincts that kept me alive. Now, years later, I still find myself thinking back to that winter. It was a harsh reminder of how fragile life is, and how quickly things can spiral out of control when the forces of nature and human frailty collide. We found all the answers we were likely to get, and the rest was left buried beneath the snow and silence of Yellowstone. The park has its share of mysteries, stories passed down from rangers who've seen things they can't quite explain. It's a place of beauty and danger, where life and death often dance far too closely for comfort. Working here, you learn to cherish every quiet moment because you never know when the tranquility will be shattered again, and you keep moving forward, step by careful step, because that's what it means to be a ranger, to protect and survive against the odds. As for me, I've accepted that some things are beyond our understanding. The wilderness is full of secrets, and maybe it's better that way. Maybe some stories are meant to stay untold, to be whispered among the trees and carried away on the wind, leaving only the echoes of what once was. I've been a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains for over two decades, but nothing prepared me for the summer of 1998. I was stationed at one of the more remote outposts, a little cabin near the edge of the park that was a good 20 miles from the nearest town. It was a job that most rangers didn't stick with for long, but I'd always appreciated the solitude. There's something about the mountains that keeps you humble. It's quiet, mostly just the wind in the trees and the distant call of birds. The trouble started in late June. There were rumors of hikers going missing, but you hear that sort of thing all the time. People underestimate the wild, thinking it's just like a stroll through a city park, and they wind up lost. Usually we find them within a day or two, dehydrated and embarrassed but alive. But this was different. Two campers, a couple from Knoxville, had vanished without a trace. They'd set out on a three-day hike and never returned. We searched for a week, combing the trails and checking every possible campsite. Nothing. No gear. No sign of them whatsoever. It was as if the forest had swallowed them whole. I remember sitting on my porch one evening, the sun dipping behind the mountains, when I heard the crunch of footsteps on gravel. It was strange. I hadn't seen another soul in days. I looked up to see a man walking towards me. He was tall and gaunt, with a face that looked like it had been carved from stone. 
His clothes were ragged, and he carried an old, battered backpack. Evening, I called out, trying to keep my voice friendly. Can I help you with something? He stopped a few yards away, looking around as if he wasn't quite sure where he was. Name's Abel, he said finally. I'm out here looking for my brother. Your brother? I repeated. He nodded. Caleb, we grew up around these parts. He's been missing for years, but I heard he might still be in these woods. Something about the way he said it gave me pause. I'd heard of people going off the grid, living out in the wilderness to escape something in their past. Maybe Caleb was one of those. I offered Abel some coffee and we talked for a while. He didn't give much away, just that he hadn't seen his brother in over thirty years and had come back hoping to find him. I wished him luck and watched as he disappeared back down the trail, a shadow among the trees. There was something about him that didn't sit right with me, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. A few days later, the park office received another report. Two teenagers, both local boys, hadn't returned from their hike. Their parents were frantic. The boys had planned to camp near the old fire tower, a popular spot despite being a good ten miles from the nearest road. We set out at first light, a group of rangers and volunteers. I was leading one of the search teams, taking the path I knew best, a narrow track that wound through dense forest and up into the hills. The forest was eerily quiet, the only sound the crunch of leaves underfoot and the distant call of a hawk. We reached the fire tower by noon. There was no sign of the boys, but we found their campsite, a small clearing with a half-collapsed tent and a cold fire pit. Scattered around were their backpacks, still packed with supplies. It was like they'd just walked away and never come back. Anything? I called to one of the volunteers as we circled the area, searching for any clue. He shook his head. Nothing. It's like they just vanished. I felt a chill run down my spine. I was starting to think this wasn't just a case of kids getting lost. There was something else out here. We kept searching, fanning out into the woods. The hours passed, the sun climbing higher and then beginning its slow descent. I was about to call it a day when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. A flash of movement among the trees. I turned, heart pounding and saw a figure standing just beyond the tree line. It was Abel. He didn't move, just stood there watching us. I called out to him, but he didn't respond. I took a step forward, but when I blinked, he was gone. It was as if the forest had swallowed him up. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The wind howled around the cabin, and the shadows seemed to stretch and twist in ways they shouldn't. I sat on the porch with my flashlight, scanning the trees for any sign of movement. The next morning, we were out again, this time with a larger search party. Word had gotten around about the missing boys, and more volunteers had turned up to help. We combed the forest, calling their names, checking every nook and cranny. By late afternoon, we were exhausted, the weight of failure heavy on our shoulders. We regrouped at the fire tower, everyone silent and grim. As we were about to head back, one of the volunteers shouted, Over here! We ran to where he was standing, and there, half buried under a pile of leaves, was a makeshift camp. It looked old, the tent weathered and torn, but what caught my eye was the stack of notebooks piled neatly inside. I picked one up and flipped it open. The pages were filled with cramped handwriting, journal entries detailing years spent living in the wild. The writer spoke of the beauty of the forest, of the freedom of living off the land. But there was something else, too. A growing paranoia. A fear that someone was watching him. I realized then that these were Caleb's journals. Abel's brother had been out here, surviving in the wilderness for who knows how long but there was something more, a darkness that seemed to creep in between the lines. We gathered the journals and headed back, the sun setting behind us. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed, 
that Abel was out there somewhere, watching, waiting. Back at the ranger station, we pored over the journals, trying to piece together Caleb's story. It was a tale of survival, of a man who had chosen to leave society behind and live in solitude. But there was something else, a shadowy figure that Caleb wrote about in hushed tones, someone he called the Watcher. Caleb believed he was being hunted, that the Watcher was always just out of sight, waiting to pounce. It was easy to dismiss it as paranoia, the ramblings of a man who had spent too long in isolation. But I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to it. A few days later, we got a break. A hunter stumbled upon a grisly scene deep in the woods, a makeshift grave hastily covered with rocks and branches. Inside were the remains of the missing boys. It was clear they hadn't died from natural causes. The discovery sent shockwaves through the community. Parents kept their kids close, and hikers stayed away from the trails. But I knew I had to go back out there to find Abel and get some answers. I set out alone, retracing our steps to the fire tower, then beyond, into the part of the forest that was less traveled. It was late afternoon when I found him, standing by a creek, his back to me. Abel, I called out. He turned slowly, his face unreadable. You shouldn't be here, he said. I know about Caleb, I replied, stepping closer. I read his journals. For a moment he didn't say anything, just looked at me with those cold, hard eyes. Then he nodded. I found him, you know, after all these years. He didn't want to come back. Why? I asked. Why did he stay out here? Abel sighed, a deep, weary sound. He was afraid. Said there was something out here, something that wouldn't let him leave. The Watcher? I ventured, feeling a chill run through me. Abel nodded. He thought it was after him, that it wouldn't stop until he was gone. I didn't know what to say. The forest around us felt suddenly oppressive, the shadows closing in. Did you kill those boys? I asked finally. His expression didn't change. I was trying to protect him. They came too close. I didn't have a choice. I reached for my radio, but he shook his head. No one else needs to get hurt. I'm leaving, going deeper into the mountains. I watched as he turned and walked away, disappearing into the trees. Part of me wanted to follow to bring him back, but I knew it would be impossible. The forest was his home now, and he knew it better than anyone. I returned to the station, my mind racing. The journals were turned over to the authorities, and a search was launched for Abel, but I knew they wouldn't find him. He was a ghost in these woods, a shadow that would remain hidden. The story of Caleb and Abel lingered with me a haunting reminder of the power of the wilderness and the darkness that can lurk within the human mind. I never spoke of it again, not to anyone. But sometimes, on quiet nights, I think about Abel out there, somewhere in the mountains, and I wonder if he ever found peace. The Great Smoky Mountains continue to be a place of beauty and mystery, a land where people can disappear without a trace, swallowed by the vastness of nature. I've seen it happen too many times to count, and while I still patrol these woods, the memory of that summer stays with me, a whisper in the trees, a reminder that some stories don't have neat endings, they just fade into the forest, like a mist that never truly lifts. <laughs>